Greetings and welcome to the H Plus Academy. As you all know, this is our launch in January of 2021, where we're all looking forward to a vigorous, healthy, long and prosperous year. Here at the H Plus Academy, what we want to do is provide the opportunity to face some of the world's issues that have yet to be addressed or that are not going into a deep dive. That's what we do here. We are the thinkers of artificial intelligence, philosophy, economic science, and the arts. And the subcategories that go along with those, of course, ethics, uh, social enhancement, uh, how we learn, equity, the political, social, economic structures. This month's roundtable is all about going meta with the brain. Our guests are well-known philosophers, Dr. Susan Schneider and Dr. Max Moore. I put links uh, for everyone in the announcements so you can read up about them and their work in the area of the future of identity and mind. They're each going to have an opening statement, a minute to state their position, and then follow up with a few areas of discussion. They are going to be discussing how uh, the cognitive, emotional, and perceptual capabilities might limit us. What are they today and where are they going to be in the future? How might brains be re-engineered biologically to enhance our capabilities? What might non-biological technologies enhance the brain? What dangers should we be looking at when considering upgrades, enhancement, and whether philosophical, psychological, or social issues should take front seat or whether there's a cohesive synthesis between them? After the round table, as you know, we have our work sessions at the half hour, we will go into intermission for a few minutes where I set up the breakout rooms and then I'll open them up for you all. Thank you. And I'm going to unmute uh, Dr. Schneider and also Dr. Moore and uh, shine the light on them. So with no further ado, let me first announce Max Moore and Susan Schneider. Thank you for being here. We're ready for you, Susan. Oh, I have one minute. Oh God, I better talk fast. And then a, a rigorous and heady discussion we look forward to. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, um, brain enhancement in one minute. All right, I've been a transhumanist since high school. So it's an honor to be working with Max and Natasha. Um, so of course, as a philosopher, I'm also a bit of a skeptic, right? I mean, I would love to be radically smarter. And I'm sure we would all love the people around us to be radically smarter and to live a really long time through science and technology. I mean, who wouldn't want this? Um, but as a philosopher, I you know, recently wrote a book, Thinking Through the Details, um, called Artificial You, AI and the Future of the Mind. Okay. And I took actually a, a middle of the road position about machine consciousness. So. I am not sure whether a sort of techno optimist view that machines will inevitably be conscious if they're highly intelligent, you know, that's just a sketch of a view, of course, but I'm not so sure that's right. And I'm also not sure that positions like John Searle's biological naturalism are right either. Um, there are a lot of deep issues here. I can talk about some of them in the discussion. But I also looked at the possibility that we might enhance our brains with AI. And of course, well, if we don't know about machine consciousness, I would caution people to be aware of the fact that we don't know whether you can replace parts of your brain with microchips that underlie conscious experience. Um, you know, so I worry that there might be, sorry to say it, design ceilings on human cognitive and perceptual enhancement because of this, um, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times on this recently, another one for the Financial Times. Um, I hope that's not the case, but I think it's an empirical issue. Um, I also have sort of philosophical concerns about this idea of merging with AI. I mean, obviously there's a question of what it is, um, you know, but I think that we need to be careful on many levels here. Because um, for example, if you replace a large part of your brain with an alternate substrate, there's an argument that could be made, a very respectable argument that it would still be you, but there's also respectable arguments that suggest that the seat of cognition and perception is actually the biological brain. So that's one concern. Another concern I have is we have to ask 
if it'll still be us at the end of the day if we radically enhance. Maybe we won't care, um, but my job as a philosopher and also someone who's opening a center uh, on these issues called the Center for the Future Mind. I'm honored that Natasha <laughs> is going to be a fellow. I'm really excited about that. Uh, you know, my idea is to really get the word out and to get social conversations going about these issues so that the public has a better conceptual under understanding of what will happen or could happen going forward um, and that they can make educated enhancement decisions themselves. Okay, I don't know if that was a minute. <laughs> That's great. Max, let's hear from you, please. Well, it's great that uh, Susan, you describe yourself as a transhumanist, I think, since, since high school. So that means we have a lot uh, to start with in common, which, of course, makes discussion a little easier. But I think yeah. there's probably some areas we're going to disagree on, which is great. So that works out well. Uh, in my view, yeah, I was kind of amused when you said that we'd like to be more intelligent and probably even more want other people to be more intelligent. <laughs> that's, that's, that's certainly true. And I think we need to be more intelligent as a society. Uh, I do think there's a lot of room for improving that. And of course, you know, people have tried various methods. You can do education, you can try meditating. All these things can, can help, but they can't fundamentally change the architecture of cognition or perception, of course. So I think we do have to look at technological means and we can maybe divide these up into two, very crudely into two areas, the biological enhancements and then the, uh, you know, the technological, well, it's not really the right word, but the, uh, the mechanical, if you want to put it kind of crudely, uh, where you, you know, use non-biological materials. So maybe the first group might not be so controversial and the second one might be more tricky. So uh, I do think about, uh, well, I just say, you know, we all want to have longer lives, longer, healthier lifespans, and that's a great thing. Uh, we like to have, you know, bones made of, of, of nano diamonds and so on, so we can get run over by a truck and just pick ourselves back up. But really just having that makes things kind of boring if we're not going to be able to, think better and see better and perceive better and feel better. So it's, this is a pretty high priority for me, certainly. When it comes to uh, the issues of, you know, will we lose ourselves, we lose our consciousness? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it sounds like I'm more sympathetic to the idea than you are that it's unlikely we would lose ourselves or our consciousness. And I think part of our discussion would be maybe, how could we test that? As opposed to just, well, I don't feel comfortable or I don't, this is where we could test that. Um, I don't know if you've come across this, this old essay from 1991 at MIT, which this always reminds me of. Uh, this fellow wrote this piece, obviously from the, the point of view of these aliens who are made of you know, some non-biological material, and that's all they've known. And they come across Earth people, and they're just flabbergasted because they say they're made of meat. And he's saying, what, they, they, they think? Yes, they think with their meat. And they just can't find it. <laughs> they find this quite incredible that they're thinking meat. Uh, so it is kind of a way of flipping the intuitions aside, I think. So, yeah, I do think it depends on how you substitute neurons for other materials um, and you know, how that works in the feedback mechanisms. But I'm fairly optimistic you could do at least a quite, quite a bit of that, maybe more so with perceptual abilities, because, uh, you know, the perceptual inputs aren't necessarily going to affect the, your cognition, uh, except with the quality of the in incoming information. So to summarize the, the short intro here, I'm pretty optimistic we can actually do quite a lot of enhancement uh, and maybe drastically more enhancement and maybe even replace ourselves entirely at some point. But I, I agree it's an issue, you know, it's pretty important if we get that wrong. So uh, let's figure out how we could actually test that hypothesis. Do I get to respond? Oh yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, so it's good. We agree on many things, Max. Um, and I know that you know an awful lot about the identity of persons over time, because I think you wrote your dissertation on it. That's right. Right? Um, okay, so in response, so I agree we need to develop tests and that we need to stay open uh, to whether microchips can underlie conscious experience, which I see as being related to the issue of machine consciousness, obviously. Um, and also we need to understand whether a person who seeks radical brain enhancement would actually be the same person over time. Or maybe they won't care about that. I mean, there's a respectable tradition that says there's no such thing as the person. And here I'm thinking of Derek Parfit, for example. And of course, you know, many Buddhists um, and the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. So on the consciousness issue, I do think there will be ways to determine whether machines can be conscious. I do. Um, and 
I don't know how the test will play out, but I mean, one thing that we need to bear in mind is that there's so much work on chips in the head right now in medicine, right? I mean, the most well-known case of this is Ted Berger's artificial hippocampus. Well, when we get to areas of the brain that underlie conscious experience, we'll find out if the chips aren't working properly when it comes to being the neural basis of conscious experience. Of course, I have to say the whole industry in neuroscience of trying to find out what the neural basis of conscious experience, you know, there are a lot of controversies, a lot of exciting debates right now, um, you know, but okay, that leads me to the issue of uh, whether we could just enhance human perception. Like suppose that we find out uh, that when we put chips in the head in areas of the brain that underlie consciousness, we're screwed. <laughs> you know, in, in behavioral tests and in, you know, first person reports, people experience dimming of conscious experience or deficits that sound like something right out of an Oliver Sacks story. Well, 2001, my mind is going. <laughs> oh, the, the part where Hal is dismantled is my favorite example. Of course, I named my, my electric car Hal. I'm a big fan and my whole my whole condo here in Florida is looks like the inside of the spaceship. I just have to say that. <laughs> but so yes, I know that scene well, the death throes of how. Right. And that could Where's happen. That? Um, it could happen. And so, you know, I do think though, um, we could have what I'd like to call an intellectual exoskeleton. And I know you and Natasha think about this all the time. You know, perhaps you go into work, you throw it on, you're smarter and you go home. And of course it does change the way your brain functions. Um, that could be possible, right? But here's my worry. Or we could have surgery, you know, and just enhance parts of the brain responsible for perception. The sad thing that worries me um, is that the parts of the brain that underlie conscious experience, according to some of the leading theories of consciousness, and here I'm thinking of like the global workspace theory, global neuronal workspace theory, uh, probably the leading theories of the neural basis of consciousness, they implicate areas of the brain responsible for attention and working memory as part of the neural basis of consciousness. So I worry that there's gonna be a bandwidth limitation on human perceptual enhancements. In other words, we can get it in the perceptual areas of the brain, but we can't process it or synthesize it in the more deliberative uh, regions or with the more deliberative mental functions that we need so that we can reason through what we're taking in. So that I see that as a challenge, a serious um, empirical and medical challenge. Um, it's informed by philosophy, um, which is interesting, but I see it as what could be, again, getting back to the issue of design ceilings, it could be a limit on how smart we humble humans could become. In contrast, the machines could become far smarter than us, but simply not be conscious. It reminds me of uh, Nietzsche's saying, when he's asking, you know, are there gods? He says, no, there cannot be gods because I couldn't stand it if there were gods. It's a very loosely paraphrased. It's kind of the opposite oh, of manual yeah, yeah. Non-conscious gods, that wouldn't be cool. Yeah. Yeah, Can no, I, that, that would be really very sad. <laughs> As but, usual, but, Nietzsche is prophetic. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you a question. I think I know the answer to this from what you said, but just to clarify, do you think it's conceivable that, let's say you're replacing neurons you know, in clusters over time, do you think you would necessarily feel that consciousness slipping away, or could you both report to outsiders and, as far as you could tell yourself, not be any different, even though you were actually losing consciousness? I guess it's kind of like a behaviorist versus functionalist kind of answer in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, philosophers always point that out. Uh, okay, well, so if we look, first of all, let me get, you know, talk to, uh, speak to the easier side, which is the uh, medical cases. I mean, it's clear from syndromes like blindness, denial, and hemisphere neglect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cases where people will literally be blind and deny it. Um, and people who have, entire half of their body that they can't move and they'll, or no, I'm sorry, they ignore, they simply right. ignore. 
and they'll reason through the whole thing. Uh, Michael Gazzaniga indicated that there might be a mental function or part of the brain called the interpreter, which is essentially the bullshit module of the brain. And I, I've always meant to see if it's bigger in some people, um, but I have a feeling it is. Like, yeah, okay, but anyway, I won't get sidetracked. But um, I do think that, um, you know, we may not even indicate, we may deny it, um, and not even intentionally, right? Um, but notice that in these cases, um, Sachs indicates that, you know, neuroscientists were able to do behavioral tests, really uh, tell all kinds of things. And we could even find out that split brain patients, you know, were really quite possibly two individuals in, in very specialized experiments. Now, philosophers, though, they have something else in mind, right? They think that, um, and I think it's controversial, that you could actually have all the causal mechanisms in place in the brain, but lack consciousness. And I actually disagree with that. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's, for one thing, extraordinarily far-fetched. Um, I think that consciousness is causal. In fact, I think that, you know, this gets to the nature of properties. What are features? Um, in science, we detect things based on their causal properties. Um, you know, there's a longstanding tradition in philosophy that says that property natures are in fact causal. So there's a big controversy in philosophy about the issues, whether these, I mean, we're essentially talking about what philosophers call zombies in a way, right? right? Except we're talking about a kind of localized zombie, uh, you know, somebody whose brain works really well, but then has the chip. And it works causally just like the brain should, but doesn't underlie conscious experience. And no, I, I don't think that that's something which is likely. Those, those weird conditions that Oliver Sacks describes so beautifully and quite scarily in many cases, the person is lying in the hospital bed and felt like there was a leg attached to them and threw it out and couldn't yeah. understand why they, all those things are so bizarre. And they do show that you know, different mental components obviously can come apart in ways that Descartes didn't understand. Descartes thought that the mind was something transparent, it was all one thing, obviously that's not the case. But of course that's a little bit different than uh, replacing functions or enhancing them with say microchips because in a, in a brain of that kind you've actually got damage, you've got lesions that are causing the damage. So yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. necessarily tell us what would happen if you plugged in chips, would that make a difference in that sense or not? I think it'd be kind of a different yeah. type of thing. No, I, I have to agree with that. I mean, I think it's tricky when you're and the first cases of the use of these brain chips, as you know, will be therapeutic. And so it will be more Moulting difficult to tell. It yeah. will, and that will be a challenge. Um, and it may be that only when we get to the point where we start replacing parts of the brain for enhancement purposes that we fully get a grasp of all of this. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I think we'll learn something more about how the brain works when we do this too. Um, it reminds me of when my computer used to break and I would bring it into the shop rather than just chuck it, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. And people would do something they called Easter egging, you know, which is you replace a part of the computer and just hope it starts working because you don't know what the is going on. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that's sort of what we will do when it comes to the brain. We'll be like, wow, I just did this with a microchip and I just learned something about the neural basis of consciousness. <laughs> yeah, I think we still have a while to, uh, to figure this out. Because I, I don't know if you know this, but you mentioned Ted Berger. I actually interviewed him back in 1994, I think. Oh, cool. Uh, in the early days at USC, I interviewed several of the people in the, in the neuroscience department there. And he was just working on you know, very small arrays uh, of the field effect transistors. And now he's up to larger arrays. I like last heard him in New York a few years ago. It's taken a long time to get very far. I'm hoping that will speed up because otherwise it's going to take an awfully long time before we have anything interesting to say. Uh, interesting I to agree. I on, I want it to happen as quickly as possible, especially with people who are ill, right? And yeah. who need these technologies, but also so that we can all think better and it will be a slow process. And um, Berger's, I think now at phase two clinical trials with the artificial hippocampus. 
yeah. which is so exciting. And the reports are that it is helping people. So now the trick, the, the Cape Campus that he's developed is obviously an incredibly rough simulation of the actual hippocampus. And it's currently external. It's outside of the head and wired in. And the trick, of course, is to get these chips in the head. And you know yeah. that's where the work of people like Elon Musk <laughs> gets really interesting, right? Yeah. 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 It's Can't starting, starting to pick enough, up. We better be careful on what, what it can and cannot achieve. That's my big shtick, right? <laughs> Will we merge with AI? I don't think so. Um, you know, I, see, I'm not a proponent of uploading because I don't think it would really be you. I think it would be like a copy of a digital copy of you. And similarly, sadly, if you replace like large parts of the brain with chips, but maybe if you do it gradually, it's safer. I don't know. I mean, yeah. well, I'm a, I'm a Parfidian. These issues is so much uncertainty. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a Parfidian. My doctor this evening was based very much on Parfit's work and just trying to extend that. So I am pretty comfortable with the idea that I can change platforms. I can become quite different as long as I have sufficient psychological connectedness and continuity between any two stages and I integrate those changes then I think it can still be me. And I don't think what I'm made of is that important. So that might be one difference. <laughs> Maybe another uh, and, time we'll have to come with that out. I think a couple days a week, I, I opt for Parfit. I opt for that is the no self view. And you know the idea that the self is really a fiction, as Nietzsche said, uh, you know, the, he said the I is a grammatical fiction, right? Um, but then in a sense, I'm not really me because there is no me. And there's no persistence over time of anything like me. Um, and it does make enhancement decisions easier if one is confident in that. Um, but what I worry about is I worry a lot. I, I don't know why, because you know, no one ever listens to me anyway, but <laughs> like, <laughs> like I worry about misleading people. Like I don't want somebody who's not sympathetic to Parfit to think, hey, I can hop on that teleporter or upload. I want them to understand that if you really believe, um, you know, in the metaphysical self, you really have to be careful as you move forward. Um, so that way, I opt for what I call a position of metaphysical humility. God, that sounds like such a cop out. But that's just because two days a week, to be honest, I think Parfit's right, but not with that much certainty. I actually think that the personal identity debate in metaphysics, um, which you know well, but not all the listeners know that this is that in, in the field of metaphysics, it's the question of under what conditions the self or person continues to exist over time, if any, right? And Derek Parfit, Frederick Nietzsche, and many Buddhists said, there's no such thing as the self. There's no condition because there's no self, right? But I mean, think about those I who believe in a soul. Actually, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't put it quite that way for Parfit, at least that's not quite my understanding of him. Certainly, he doesn't believe there's a self in the sense that you know Hume didn't. Hume thought there were just a series of impressions. But yes, I Hume. Think he, I think he does grant that you know that there is there is a psychology, and that has to continue with sufficient continuity for you to still exist. So he's not completely dismissing, dismissing the sense of the self. I don't, I don't think. Yeah, there is this relation of psychological continuity, but I don't think it's backed by any persisting me or right. self in a rich metaphysical sense, right? right? Something like soul, you know, you still have to mention soul. And that's something that has, you know, bothers me all the time. I taught philosophy of religion for a number of years, and I still discuss this quite often. I'm always baffled when people talk about the soul and how that's the real you, uh, especially if you really take it to the extreme and believe in reincarnation and you come back as a cow or a totally different person. In what sense have you survived at all just because you have this thing called the soul? What use is it? <laughs> that's what I always end up saying. What use is a soul? It doesn't carry any part of me that I care about. Isn't it fascinating to think about? I mean, I get, you know, really nervous or worried because I think we humans don't have the slightest clue what's going on. And I get worried actually because of issues in physics, right? With um, the debate over relativity and quantum mechanics and, and different theories of quantum gravity and the uncertainty that is there right now about the very nature of time and the very nature of space. I mean, the idea that space time is emergent. And my own view is that until we resolve all of that, we don't even really understand what time is or what space is. And if that doesn't tell us something super important about the nature of the self, what would, right? Yeah. I mean, are we spatial? Are we temporal? Um, I think that, you know, for me, you know, humans speculate 
about this stuff, but hopefully we'll have some better sense. Um, I don't know, maybe it'll all come together. That would be exciting, you know, but I'm getting speculative here, but well, I mean, no, that's I, I basically think... why I opt for a position of metaphysical right. uncertainty and individual choice. And I know the no. transhumanists are very- Of course, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing I, I think, yeah, what you're saying is maybe something important to emphasize, uh, maybe not so much a transhumanist, but this idea that we have not figured everything out remotely. I mean, we look back on the past and we see how incredibly wrong we were about things, you know, geocentrism versus heliocentrism and all this kind of stuff. We were so badly wrong, badly wrong in our physics. We should not imagine that we've pretty much figured it out. <laughs> I think there's a sense among a lot of people that, you know, the experts know their stuff and they've got it pretty much right. And Probably not. This is a huge amount of time still ahead of us. We're going to learn an awful lot more. And you know, you mentioned you know, we know the, there are inconsistencies with uh, general, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics. They just don't really fit together. There's got to be a whole new system out there that we haven't discovered yet. So let's not get too comfortable that we know much at all. Maybe as we begin to develop ultra smart computers and enhance the brain, we will actually know more about how to get to the next step. Right. And so the modest approach is how do we get there from here, given that we're uncertain about where there is, uh, if that makes any sense. I mean, we don't really know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird, weird, but in, intriguing place to be. Yeah. You know, I'd also want one, maybe one maybe final point, I guess, getting towards the time, uh, just to make the point, that I'm sure you'd agree that if we're talking about upgrading our, um, our consciousness, our perceptions, our cognition, our emotions with, with biological technology or non-biological technology, I think one thing to emphasize, certainly for non-transhumans, is we're not very conscious right now. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the over sex stuff kind of shows how bad that can go wrong. But even for normal people, we're really not very conscious. We don't know what's nope. going on. The psychologists have shown, you can actually experimentally demonstrate that people give reasons for things which are actually not true. You can actually demonstrate they have you know, your... Uh, coming up with, with stories about why you do things. So we have very little awareness of what we're thinking, how, especially what we're feeling, because partly because of evolution, we've grown these pathways that go from our, our perceptions to, uh, you know, time to run, I'm scared, I've got to run. We don't have many pathways that go in the other direction, allowing our cognition to go to our emotional centers. That's just not something we evolved to have, because our, you know, our life was a lot simpler back then. So uh, you know, we're really not very conscious right now. So that kind of- Yeah, really uses yeah that's why we need therapists. Forward. Yeah. Um I know, I mean, only a small part of all of the mental activity going on in the brain at any given time is conscious. And so one possibility for human enhancement, which I find personally very exciting, if it's possible, would be to enhance consciousness and make more of our mental lives conscious. And also, you know, I like the discussions I see like by people like Daniel Kahneman on system one and system two and you know how, the conscious systems are slow and deliberative and they get tired. I mean, our judgments are notoriously fallible. I mean, like if we haven't had lunch, there, there are cases of judges saying no to people's pleas, you know, before lunch, no, 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 early in the day, okay. <laughs> you know, if we have like enhancements that help orchestrate the connectivity between system one and system two, but the problem with all this, I mean, it's not just the consciousness problem. The other problem is data privacy. Oh my God. Um, you know, who wants our innermost thoughts being sold to Cambridge Analytica or whatever, right? To the highest bidder. Well, I guess my view on that is that uh, as long as you have informed consent, then you might be free to do that, maybe you find that worthwhile. But for most of us, I think, no. <laughs> yeah. the right to control our, our property and our own thoughts. I see our moderator is coming back. I think our time is up. Oh, yeah. Very I, what a heady discussion. You know, it's, it's always a challenge, Susan and Max, to lift off with your, you know, one minute to grasp that and then to see where it leads you. So it's, you know, it's almost like that one minute and, and the first five minutes or 10 minutes of a discussion probably our best backstage and then when you get to this this point of intriguing dialogue to then highlight it because that's what I saw going on and I love the way that um, each of you took a, a position um, whether it's the parfait or whether it's um, AI will not merge with the human brain what is consciousness 
and then bring it around to the the realization that we simply don't know and susan you brought that up and max you you took it a step further with that we simply don't know what is going on a lot of the time and it's really challenging to consider that perhaps what that um, means is something totally different than what, that we, what we have available to us. Could there be a progress in understanding the possibility of non-biological consciousness? So outside the brain, which would be obviously chemical since we live in a, a chemical environment and not just the behavioral test, but also some breakthrough in theories that um, about what underpines uh, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I tend I mean, to agree as well. And Max, what is your what is your thought there that consciousness could be something that is not strictly biological, that it could be some, we could identify it in other ways outside our own um, anthropocentric yeah, I'd, view. I'd, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Uh, if we couldn't have consciousness in non-biological means. I think it's, it's largely kind of evolutionary accident, maybe in the conditions on this planet, couldn't really bring consciousness to other uh, other platforms, but I don't see any particular reason why they couldn't have organized correctly. And of course, we may actually make faster progress on that than we do with our brains because we can probably do it a lot faster, uh, run experiments a lot more quickly yeah. and more easily scan inside and know what's going on and replicate them. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that was a good question. And it, and it does bring that away from philosophies about human existence but it's also about life in general and existence in general. And the anthropocentric view of consciousness may not be the, the path to take in un, unveiling, un, unwrestling, un, un yeah. unwrestling this, this sense of what identity is and what it means to be aware. Here's another question. What concerns do you have about persons or um, bad organization, militant organizations hacking into our brain implants? Oh, wow. Um, well, if you Google my name and you Google one zero, I did a little piece on this with Evan Selinger, but I mean, cyberpunk dystopia, right? I mean, situations where suppose you get an implant and you need to pay a subscription to keep it. Um, so think about the cloud right now, like these different services. What if you can't afford it any longer and you lose all memories of your first child or something awful, right? I mean, you know, these are the kinds of things that I used to read a lot of science fiction. Um, or what if to keep your cognitive capacity, to keep your enhancement, or even to stay alive, you need to pay your subscription? Or what if you're in an authoritarian dictatorship, like China, right? Uh, I mean, that worries me tremendously, the way AI technology used in the wrong hands could lead to thought control. I mean, we're almost there to be honest with this. Um, like Facebook is rolling out a wristband that detects motion initiation in the brain. And it is literally months away from beta testing. Let me take it to Max there. Max, you mentioned Parfait and your your view the, the continuity of identity separate from what we call soul, but that the that it is that the continuity of personhood that makes us who we are, and to keep that intact is crucial to being alive and then for crucial to consciousness. What is your view about some of these legal issues about ownership of identity? And as Susan said, <laughs> what if it goes to the cloud? You have to have a um, subscription and pay it on a yearly or monthly basis in order to download your memories, for example. Well, I think the, the best answer really is right now is uh, be careful what operating system you used. I was <laughs> actually quite, quite reassured when uh, Ben Goetzel in a discussion we had uh, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, I, I brought up some of these issues and you know, I was quite worried about people being able to hack into your brain and that kind of thing. And if I remember Ben's answer correctly, he said that there are actually secure operating systems. It's just that nobody's really using them right now, except you know, I'm a few computer scientists, but they're actually really strongly uh, interference tech timber proof operating system. So I think, you know, that's, you want to be absolutely sure you're using one of those kind of operating systems rather than, you know, the, the stuff we use every day, because obviously that's the most important thing not to get hacked into. You know, it's bad enough when someone steals our identity through our credit cards, we don't want to actually steal our identity. <laughs> that would be a lot worse. <laughs> It would be a lot worse. Susan, do you, okay. I, I'll stop here because we've got uh, breakout sessions and we'll probably have part two of this to take a deeper dive 
uh, now that we've assessed some of the, the interests that you share and some of the uh, differences that you share, as well as some of the, the interesting questions of um, people in the, in the meeting. And it's always good to get a, a temperature on the room of what people are thinking about, what people are interested in, and how we can best answer their questions because that's what we're here for, to um, consider that as primary for our, our organization and our members. Uh, I'm going to close now with providing each of you a minute to wrap up a point that you want to make from the, um, the broader spectrum of the conversation into just a, a final comment that would identify your particular position on the topic. Um, Susan, you go first and Max, you close, please. Okay, I'll throw something else out that I didn't get out. <laughs> okay, so here's something that worries me. I bet a lot of you are agnostic about the nature of God or um, atheist. And you might say, so why do I need to worry about personal identity? Well, how many of you think that your the well-functioning cognitive system that you hopefully have depends on having a well-functioning brain? So I'm not saying the mind is the brain that gets into dicey metaphysical territory, but there does seem to be a dependency relation there. Now, again, I love science fiction. So there's this story by Greg Egan, in which a microchip is inserted in the brain. Actually, it's more than a chip. It's a series of chips called the jewel. And over time, it replicates uh, all one's mental functions. And then at the end of the day, it's science fiction. Uh, the it happens when you're a child and then when you're around 12, they just go ahead and take your brain out because the jewel's able to simulate everything perfectly that you think or do. Now, if you think that having a well-functioning cognitive system depends on the gray matter that you have, I wonder what happens in that case, right? When the parents scoop out the kid's brain, does he die? And I'm totally fine thinking that the jewel itself may be intelligent and maybe even conscious, right? But did he live on? And I'm saying, at least I said in this piece I wrote for the Financial Times that I was skeptical that the jewel was really him. So I just wanna leave you with that sad thought because I wanna be immortal and I'm sure you do too, or at least to hang out until the, the heat death, right? Thank you, Susan, well said. I have to, I have to uh, second the mention of Greg Egan. His books are really worth reading. That was a great story. And Permutation City and other novels, really good, well thought out books, along with uh, Ted Chiang, like two of my favorite oh, science fiction writers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, reading that, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm more sympathetic, I guess, being, being much of a Parthidian, but you would continue. Um, of course, if you did, if you scooped out the brain but kept it intact, then it, from my point of view, you would have become two new people. Uh, the logic of identity would have broken down, but you would survive in two new people, which is a lot better than not surviving. But it is a tricky one. It's a hard sell, I know. <laughs> so, Max, what is your, uh, that was a response to Susan's closing. Uh, will you make your closing statement, please? Uh, that, that was my closing statement, really. I didn't want to bring up anything, anything new because then we're going to have another discussion about something else. I, I do want to thank Susan, though, for, for having a really stimulating discussion, and I think uh, it'd be great to continue this at some point. Oh, I would love that. Thank you, oh, Matt. Good. Well, we'll have part two uh, coming up, let's say, probably maybe March, April would be a good date to do that. In the interim, I can receive questions from attendees and others so that it'll be more pointed. Also, in the second session um, of this um, brain topic and the future of mind, I think we could uh, set up some questionnaires, some ideas for um, everyone, and I can add that to the Zoom so we can have that to look at during our session as well. So I wanna thank both of you very much, Susan and Max. It was enjoyable, appreciate you being here and looking forward to round two of this round table. <laughs>to do now is take a short intermission. Everyone stay here. Don't leave, please, because we have three workshops that members are leading. Um, so we have three breakout rooms. Uh, the first room is on um, 
values and it picks up from this discussion and um, that will be uh, led by one of our members. Um, the second one is um, about virtual reality, where it's going, what the future holds for it, which is also led by a member. And this will all be set up for you in just a moment. And the third breakout room is on Transvision 2021, which takes place in Madrid, Spain. So if you all give me a moment, I will uh, handle the breakout rooms, just stay here. And when that happens, you will be able to decide which room that you wanna go into. If for any reason you have a problem getting into a room, just ping me, uh, let me know or put it in the chat because I will be checking them. And our board members will be joining in the breakout rooms to be supportive of our members and their topics. So, um, okay, intermission now, and I'm gonna be setting up the breakout rooms. Thank you. Oh, here's our host, Natasha. Hey. Yes. Well, good to see you, Natasha. We are talking friendly here about the future and about uh, transition and getting to know all the people. So we all know you, uh, but uh, Michael Epstein just joined. So maybe you can say hello, Michael, and tell us where you are. Hello, I'm from Atlanta. I'm professor of cultural theory at Emory University. And I have been following uh, some fragments of uh, transhumanist or uh, humanity plus movement since I think uh, the 1990s. Uh, not consistently, but uh, periodically. And I'm writing a lot about the future, uh, but my uh, major language is Russian. So I have published a lot uh, in Russian. In English, I pu uh, published the book, The Transformative. S certainly discussion. Um, about how uh, we fit into the rest of society. Um, and when we start talking about the uh, a, a good ways of, of, of thinking and bad ways of thinking, um, I think we'll come up against tremendous resistance, uh, especially amongst those people who do not think in the good ways which we might promote. Well, I agree with I, you, Greg. Well said. Oh, sorry, Robin, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just saying that, you know, as long as we have equality of opportunity, I think, and the people can attain the best they can do in their lives, um, what we sh our message should be is be happy with what you are. Um, and those people who choose augmentation, um, you know, are, <laughs> we're all in it together. Um, the, uh, those of us who um, might choose that, hopefully are going to be able to make a significant contribution to the human race as a whole. There, there's an uh, uh, aspect of this in uh, what we've experienced during the pandemic. You might think people would just get less medical care except for having COVID but the amount of plastic surgery has, has a Overall is decided it will be three days. We would like to have about 300 international participants mm -hmm. in the most beautiful cultural place in Spain, which is called the Athenium, the Ateneo, Ateneo in Spanish, the Athenium of Madrid. So that will be the place which actually is celebrating uh, a bicentennial, 200 years of existence. So it really is a fantastic place with a lot of history. And it has so much history that we will talk about the future in this place during the 200 year celebration. So but, Jose, uh, if uh, me medical conditions will not allow, is it possible to think about uh, this conference as an online event or it's only in person? Well, we will delay uh, because I want to have it in, in person, physically. I want people to come to Madrid and to this fantastic venue, cultural venue, the most important cultural historic venue of Spain. So it has to be physical, it has to be with people present. Mm -hmm. So if anything bad happens, we will delay the conference until people can travel. Jose, what are your tentative dates right now? 
the dates now are uh, June 4, 5, 6. I think it can still be made that time, but um, we'll have to wait at least one month. We're going to be a little too soon. That so may I, be optimistic. Yeah, I think so. But, but I am optimistic. I think the vaccinations will move very fast now. Um, anyway, let me say hello or hear from the two people who haven't spoken, and then Natasha, obviously, who is the boss. Um, <laughs> so, Andres and Jose from Brazil, do you want to say anything? And then Natasha, uh, Andres, and Jose? You are mute. You are muted, Andres, and the same with Jose. You are muted. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, first, hello to all of you, uh, and that I hope to see you in transition. Uh, we were planning to do it in June, but now we are not sure. But uh, it will. It, it's going to be a great event, and of course, uh, we wait all of you. Thank you, Maybe. Natasha. And indeed, we want to make it physical, which is what I explained to yeah. Michael Epstein. Uh, we are humans uh, still. So <laughs> humans are social animals. And I want people to, to be here together. By the way, uh, Michael, last time we had um, five Russians. And this year, I, I hope to have at least 10 Russians. Well. transhumanists as the standard bearers for science. And so we, we should participate in getting the message across that science actually improves every aspect of people's lives. Um, I remember when after the war, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't born at that time, but soon <laughs> after the second world that you were in Britain, for instance, most households didn't have central heating. Um, they didn't have the financial wherewithal to enjoy the standard of living which we now all have. And really that's all down to science. But um, nonetheless, the, 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 an awful lot of people are biting the hands that feed them. Yes. If I might, um, I think with this new age of communication that we're in, conspiracy theories and misinformation are running rapid. And so educating people about science isn't just giving them like a dogmatic answer, right? People are going to look on the internet and find their own answers. And so I think it's really important that we have a focus on teaching critical thinking above just teaching answers, right? We need people to be able to take comfort in the fact that they're making that decision for themselves. They need to be able to understand how to evaluate that evidence rather than feel that they're just having, like there are people who think they're being microchipped from the vaccination, right? That, that's <laughs> ludicrous, but at the same time, you know, they have these microchips already, well, microchips in their phone. They're being tracked already. But it's that misinformation and the inability to, you know, critically evaluate that I think is really causing this problem. It's not just giving them the tools and hoping they know what to do. <laughs> right. I appreciate that. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining because obviously, uh, we're all in this together. Just one thing I'd like to leave everybody with, and, and hopefully we'll continue the dialogue, you know, in, in future opportunities. But a few things I heard that I think are part of what we can do. One is there's ongoing body of research that's done by the scientific community that we're part of, right? So we have a lot of folks who are highly intelligent, well-educated, who are part of finding answers, you know, to better humanity. And so that's part of this community. And it's very important that that information, like Natasha was just saying, is translated down into the so what to the average person, right? We could put it in terminology that they understand. And I'll, I'll, real quick story for me. I mean, I wouldn't be here today if it really wasn't for Carl Sagan. When I was a young child, you know, he had the ability, he had a way of communicating science to children. And, he, and there's a lot of children that he didn't connect with, but he connected with a great many. 
right? And we need to do that over and over and over again in every possible way. Because what it boiled down to was I trusted Carl. It's about yeah. trust, right? And so if I look at my community here, I live in, the, in Georgia, the United States, deep south. There's a church on every corner and everybody goes to church. And that's where they talk. And that's where they think about these kinds of things. And that's who they trust. And that's an information source. Some of it's positive and some of it's not. Um, I think that there has to be other places people can go where they trust the information they're receiving. And that's what Natasha and I were talking about. I think mm -hmm. this community could help serve that purpose, even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, because it takes a lot of effort and time to convince a mind to trust you and to trust what, you, what you're providing them for information. And, and as um, the uh, other lady said, they have to come to that conclusion themselves. Mm -hmm. You can't force it, right? So. I think as we continue forward, um, we try to find ways of working together to, to serve that purpose, right? To be a voice that people can trust. Um, I know I'd like to participate in that and however, you know, just as one person, I would like to be a part of that. And I think with, with the folks that are on this call and, and all the rest of the folks that are part of this community, um, there's something that we can do to, to build that community, you know, to get people to listen to something else besides what they've been hearing, which in a lot of cases does not advocate humanity or humaneness. And so I just would like to leave it with that for us to think about and, and hopefully we'll continue the conversation in, uh, in future get-togethers. The Oculus too. Um, work with Oculus Quest too, yes, because um, they don't really need to adapt those things to any new device because those are kind of, it's, it's more on the software side. So the hardware doesn't really have to be com uh, compatible because since everything is in the cloud right now and you don't, you don't need the cords anymore, it's done through software. So yeah, uh, all of those devices uh, should connect with Oculus Quest too. Okay, and uh, just an update um, for, I'm not too sure if you're planning on getting one, but um, seems like they're, a little bit backtracked right now. So if you would order one right now, you would probably won't get it until early February or something like that. Um, but yeah, the demand is huge. And even though they fix the supply chain, they still can't um, deliver enough headsets. And um, again, we all know um, Facebook's uh, ethics and practices. Um, they're actually selling this as a law, as, at a loss. So they're, they're losing around 50 bucks per headset. Um, just to take market share from everyone else. For us, you know, developers and consumers of VR, that's amazing, right? But for their competitors, it sucks because they're taking everyone out right now with, with this strategy. So are you planning on doing like a live presentation in VR or um, building something that can be delivered at any point, at any time um, for the people? Number two, uh, number although two, I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't negate number one, what do you think? What is your view? So, so for number one, I can suggest um, app that it's actually available right now and we won't have to build anything from, from scratch. Uh, okay. That app allows, allows people to make a, a new room for you know, presentations in virtual reality. And uh, the name of it is actually Engage. Um, so I'll, I will share with you the, the exact um, link of the company. But yeah, if, if there is an opportunity to host virtual reality um, sessions, the question is how many people have the VR headset within the H plus community? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend any other one because it would just make a, a bad impression on okay. VR. Fair enough. So, so, so that's, that's what actually, impacted the, in the industry in a bad way until now that the cheaper headsets were yeah so if uh, anyone uh, else has any know. yeah um three things first mm. i would like also following uh gennady and natasha to invite you to participate in our conference typically in september it is scientific conference in general <clears throat> on Vanguard uh, instruments in management. But every conference, first two days, are intended on transhumanism and longevity. OK. Uh, would you like to, I would like to invite you to participate with something like uh, VR for the future, or whatever you prefer. 
Yeah, yeah. Second, sure. second thing, so that's <laughs> my invitation. Second, uh, it's an addition to what you said about um, using VR in um, mental health. On uh, the last conference, there was a gentleman, a colleague of us, a friend of us from Italy, Alessandro Di Carlo, who mm -hmm. presented a presentation for using VR for psychiatric purposes when his patients were medical staff from northern Italy, who... So, um, thank you all. It's been a, an excellent breakout session and a wonderful academy. And we will see you all in Madrid, whenever. But I'll look forward to that. See you, Paul. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Live long and prosper. See you in Madrid. See you in the USA. And see you even on Mars. Let's go to Mars. <laughs>